you know, I've heard for decades, people talking about how data has value, kind of like money, but yet you're not able to copy money. So why, why is that? Why can't you just print money from your printer? Well, there's a good reason for that. So why can you print data from your printer, like copy? Why, why does data sharing require, here's a copy of my data. And if you think that through it, you know, that's the root cause for a lot of the problems in, in even the world today, when you think of like misinformation and, and whatnot, is the, the lack of lineage and accountability and ownership. And quite frankly, owning data is irrelevant if you can't have control over that data. And as soon as you make a copy of something, you've lost control over that. It's as simple as that. Uh, so that's where the idea of access, not copies came. Uh, and that's the uh, inspiration for the data collaboration Alliance. And maybe that brings us to, like you mentioned, the, uh, the, the, uh, web 3.0 originally centered around, uh, semantics and, and knowledge management. And these days it's kind of taken a slightly different twist. Obviously data is at the center of that, uh, in both of those incarnations, but, uh, I'm curious, what, what do you think the the next evolution means not so much to businesses, but to everyday people? Um, that's a good question. As much as it is a tough one, to be honest with you. Mm -hmm. Um, I think for most people today, when they uh, hear the term uh, web uh, 3.0, uh, they tend to think in terms of uh, cryptocurrency and well, NFTs and ICOs and things like that, which, uh, uh, for many people, and I wouldn't actually really blame them for that, uh, for many people, I think they think of those things in terms of uh, speculation, really, and kind of Wild West. And while that certainly is true, there, there is a lot of that going on, I think there's also some, uh, well, some technical, uh, some value to, to be had from the technical underpinnings of, of that world. And in my view, it mostly has to do with uh, the cryptography aspect. So there's lots of talk about, uh, well, decentralization, but actually, if you start looking under the hood in all those projects and technical implementations that claim to be uh, decentralized, they're not that decentralized after all. I mean, there are certain centralization points, de facto, actually, centralization points, such as exchanges or, you know, in the case of uh, NFTs, uh, minters that act as, like I said, de facto centralization points. However, to me, the most interesting uh, aspect in this whole ecosystem from the uh, technology point of view, there are a few, actually. So the first one would be cryptography itself. So the fact that uh, you can have cryptographically enabled guarantees that, you know, a uh, certain piece of data is what they tell you it is, or that certain calculations have taken place and, you know, this, this is the result. And also what I find rather uh, intriguing about this ecosystem is uh, so-called uh, DAO, so distributed autonomous uh, organizations, which are built on top of uh, smart contracts. Again, that uh, is I would say tightly coupled with the cryptography aspect because, well, smart contracts are basically distributed programs running in uh, virtual machines on top of, well, cryptographic, again, guarantees. So a certain program will perform in the way it's supposed to perform and you can have proof of that. So these are the aspects that I think are most interesting in what people see today as Web 3.0. I'm not so sure how that relates, let's say, to the original incarnation of Web 3.0, but uh, I guess we'll have some, some time to explore that. Yeah, I think there's, so my, my take on it, like if I think of it to just maybe someone outside of the technology industry or someone who doesn't uh, understand all the, the nuances of how things work. Again, the way that I think about it is the, the Web 1.0, uh, as some would call it, was uh, that there was a small number of producers of content and a large number of consumers of that content, but they were consumers. It was one way as a consumer, I may consume content from many different sources, but uh, I'm a consumer, not a producer. And the, the 2.0 version of that is when it became such that the consumers are also the producers. Um, so you're not just, you know, viewing content, you're contributing content, whether you're posting a photo on, on Facebook or uh, tweeting something or doing something you're you're contributing your own unique perspective out into the world where that's exciting because it now facilitates crowdsourcing. But at the same time, there's a cost to that, which is for me to share my photo, for me to share my tweet, for me to share whatever is I'm in inevitably giving up control 
over whatever it is that I'm actually sharing. Uh, so I'm basically dropping whatever I want to share into this black hole. And what happens with that is out of my control. It could be duplicated. It could be uh, taken out of context. It can uh, have considerations that maybe I didn't think about when I just wanted to share photos of my kids with my family on, online and things like that. And so, uh, so to me, the main theme of the next uh, shift that's going to impact everyday people, uh, which I think does bring in the elements of crypto and, and blockchain and and the semantic web and the separation of data from applications and all these considerations is what they all have in common is the enablement of control such that the web 2.0 where everyone can produce and share and collaborate can be done so without having to compromise and lose control over your own information over your own content uh, so on and so forth such that not only can information I see be more trustworthy, but information I release, I can be more trustful that I'm going to retain control over that. It's two sides of the same coin, if, if that makes sense. It does. Uh, I would just like to um, to bring it to the conversation, uh, you know, the oft quoted adage that, well, with great power comes great uh, responsibility, but I would extend that to include control as well, because if you think about it, what does having control actually means in the context that you just described? So fine, yes, you know, in web 2.0 applications such as you know, uh, Facebook or Twitter, all of those uh, social networks, yes, you do have a platform to share, you know, your content or your thoughts or whatever, but that comes at the expense that, well, it's somebody else's platform. So you're playing on somebody else's terms and well, your content is not your content Really, it's, you know, it just right. belongs to the platform. Yeah, I'm feeding the content to the other party more than I'm sharing my content or giving access to my content. I'm essentially donating it <laughs> for, for purposes that I may not understand. That's yeah. true, but there's the flip side to that, which is, well, you can't get something for nothing. In this case, the platforms do give uh, something to users as well. You know, they have invested yeah. heavily in building out those platforms. They're investing heavily in data centers and mobile applications and availability and, you know, algorithms and whatnot. To, to be fair, they're not just, you know, ripping you off. They are giving something in return for what they're getting. So the alternative to that would be like, okay, would it be possible to have platforms that are, let's say, collectively developed, open source and self-hosted so that you can have control. And then, you know, when you, when you start exploring this idea, then you inevitably, I would say, get into the question like, okay, so perhaps my platform of choice is not your platform of choice. And, you know, you have 10 people and you have potentially uh, five different platforms uh, being used among those 10 people. Is there a way to interoperate between those five different platforms? If not, then you end up with a fragmented ecosystem and the, uh, the advantage of having a platform sort of goes away. Yeah, I think one of the um, one of the realizations that I've that I've had is the the platform of the future, and I would say even the application of the future as we know it, is one that will inevitably not manage data uh, in isolation of other platforms and other applications. It will be largely a, an experience on top of data that relies on the underlying infrastructure, like the future of whatever the evolution of the internet is. Uh, and, and my view is that it's the separation of the data from the experience to basically enable a, an outcome where the owner of data is always aware of uh, who has access and can grant and revoke access and platforms will come and go, but, uh, they will no longer trap data or store data or have copies of data, so on and so forth. And Without that, I can't imagine how you could actually enable control. So whether it's decentralization or other things, I don't see how you can get to that simple outcome for the, again, if I just sim over, maybe oversimplify it for the same reasons why no matter what you do, uh, if you try to enable the duplication of physical currency, you're going to devalue that, that currency just as a simple example. Uh, so the, the same principle, but applying it to, to date. So, I mean, I don't know if that's the, the consensus yet. That's definitely my view is that that's the kind of mandatory and, and quite frankly, inevitable shift is that separation. 
And if you think of the, the original semantic web and, you know, where data is linked, just like how documents can be linked. Uh, so that's pointers, it's, it's access. It's not copying like a, a one HTML page doesn't need to contain another HTML page for it to have be linked to it. It, it can point to it, right? And, and extending that from, uh, away from semi-structured or unstructured documents down to the data itself is, is really what the original thought was. But does, does that make sense? Do you see it that way? Do you see it differently? Is because you're, you're kind of alluding to the the decentralization as being able to enable those controls, but do you see that without the separation of the data from the platform? I think, well, I think it does make a lot of sense to separate the data from uh, the data from the uh, overlying applications, let's say. It, obviously, it also, again, brings another layer of questions to, uh, to be answered and well, yeah. One of them, I think, potentially the the most fundamental one in in my view is like the um, what comes as part and parcel of uh, being in control of your data. So uh, I think most people wouldn't really want, wouldn't be able to, to begin with. But even if they were able, they wouldn't really want to uh, have like their own uh, server in the basement. Right. And that means that well, if you go. You, if you if you don't go for that scenario, then you have to actually trust someone else with hosting your data, and this is where the compl complications uh, begin, actually, because then if you do, how can you uh, how can how can you have control over what happens to your data? How can you make sure that this other party doesn't get to uh, you know to to peek into your data? And this is where I think the uh, the crypto uh, aspect may come in handy because. Yes having cryptography uh, you may be able to you know have your cake and eat it so to speak so have your data being hosted somewhere else while at the same time ensuring that whoever is hosting your data will not uh, get to exercise rights that you don't uh, grant over that data yeah so just just to add to that that makes a lot of sense because if again you translate that to the to the old world of you know uh, pre-crypto uh, currencies the ability for me to keep my savings under my mattress or in a safe in my house or use a bank and have some trust in in that bank and that's a combination of the bank itself having controls having a reputation and it being regulated and a bunch of other factors and it it doesn't mean that my money will never be stolen, but if it is, it's a crime. And uh, so if they get caught, someone goes to jail and, and you're continuously adding uh, mechanisms, whether it's to the currency or to the regulations to minimize that risk, it will never be zero. What you described, it sounds very uh, similar to that in that I should be able to run a server in my basement, i.e. put the money under my mattress uh, or put it in a bank. It sounds like we both agree though, that the, regardless of that, the separation of that data, be it in my server, in my house, or in, in a data bank that I trust that's regulated and has standards and uses encryption, et cetera. Um, it itself is managing the data on my behalf. It's, it's not the platform that may then be utilizing that data. Meaning if I then am using some platform to do some operation, whether that's, you know, participating in a social network or performing a transaction or, or whatever it is that I'm doing in the world, it in turn is perhaps getting access to my data, be it from the server in my home or from my data bank, but it's not storing it, duplicating it, copying it. It's not taking it out of its control zone. It's just getting access to either see it or even in some cases to change it. Does that make sense? Like, so it's still the separation of the data from the use case of that, but the data layer can't be such that every individual citizen needs to run their own infrastructure because that ain't going to work. Is that, does that all make sense? Yeah, yeah, of course. Again, you know that that opens the the floor for a number of other questions. Like, okay, fine, let's let's separate uh, the data layer from the application layer. But then, yeah. how yeah. do we standardize, let's say, the uh, the interaction between them? And you know, yeah. how yeah. do we connect to the data layer? And how do yeah. we ensure yeah. availability and all of those things? Yeah. But I guess we're going to have to tackle those in a follow up <laughs> conversation because uh, we're almost out of time. Yeah. Yeah. But I do agree. I think that's the real question now is the, the establishment of those standards to enable that interoperability is what's going to really unlock that end benefit to the everyday citizen that we talked about earlier. But, uh, yeah, I definitely look forward to having a further conversation and digging into that. Okay, great. Let's, uh, let's hold on to that thought and uh, we can uh, continue from, uh, we can pick up from where we left off next, next time. Sounds good. Thank you.